John Strope. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag History Lecture Series. Lectures are held monthly on the third Thursday in the auditorium at the Nebraska History Museum at 15th and P Street in Lincoln. The programs have a live audience, are taped by City TV 5, are broadcast on government access channels in Lincoln, Omaha, Bellevue, Hastings, North Platte, Grand Island, Papillion, South Sioux City, and Beatrice, and are posted on YouTube. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all of the Society's programs and services, can be found on the Society's website at www.nebraskahistory.org. If you are not already a member, I encourage you to join. Benefits of membership include subscriptions to Nebraska History Magazine and the Society's newsletter, use of a microfilm reader printer in the Society's library archives to make free copies from microfilm, free admission to the Society's seven historic sites, discounts in the Society's landmark stores at the History Museum, the State Capitol, and Chimney Rock, and reduced fees for kids' classes. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television across the state and on the Society's YouTube page. To Excuse me. To find that page, just type into your browser www.youtube.com slash user slash Nebraska Historical. There are over 140 past brown bags on YouTube. Our speakers are Clark Archer and John Hibbing, and their topic is Elections Past, we can't know 2016 without understanding the past. Just to let you know about asking questions, both prefer you wait until the end of the program to ask. Our first speaker is John Clark Archer, a professor of geography in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska. He has taught geography and cartography at NU since 1985. Clark earned his BA in political science at Indiana University, his MA in geography at IU, and his PhD in geography at the University of Iowa. He is the co-author of several books, including Historical Atlas of U.S. Presidential Elections, 1788 to 2004, Atlas of 2012 Elections, Atlas of the Great Plains, and Atlas of Nebraska, which will be coming out in 2017 from the University of Nebraska Press. I will introduce John Hibbing before he speaks. Now please join me in welcoming Clark Archer. Thank you, John. Okay, I'd like to begin by thanking the Nebraska State Historical Society for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk about and to look at uh, some history of elections, and I'll bring it up to the present in various ways. Uh, the, this, in, in a way, this is sort of a built-in commercial uh, that indicates uh, where some of the material comes from. Um, a fair amount of it comes from a historical atlas of U.S. presidential elections, which would mention going back to 1798. Uh, that was the first atlas to uh, map elections at a county scale back to that time. Uh, there are various other uh, writings uh, that I have collaborated on. Now what I'm going to do to begin with is put presidential elections in a constitutional framework and for and also in a historical framework. Um, I collaborated with a British author and he pointed out to me that our uh, Democratic Party and Republican Party are probably the oldest continuously active political parties in the world. Um, actually even predating uh, British political parties which didn't become uh, mass based until the 1830s or thereabouts. Uh, the Democratic Party you can argue about when it began but it can be traced back to at least 1800. 
and maybe before that, uh, the Republican Party back into the 1850s. Uh, so we have an old party system. Now, another thing that I think adds a lot of interest to looking at the span of American elections is that uh, after all, the United States was settled from east to west, and so there was an effect, a change, or a, an evolution, a series of frontiers, and that series of frontiers had relevance to elections at a particular time. There was a rural frontier, an urban frontier, and I think it's fair to say there's now a metropolitan frontier. And uh, election patterns, election cleavages relate to those, uh, to those historical trends, settlement trends. Uh, I'm interested in uh, geography of economic patterns and settlement patterns, etc. Now, to look, the electoral college system um, involves an indirect method for electing the president. Uh, so, uh, with the electoral college in between, in effect, uh, you and I, as citizens of the United States, vote for members of an assembly, and those assemblies meet in each individual state and are expected to vote for. Uh, to cast votes for president. So uh, the really important votes, in a sense, are not your vote and my vote, but rather uh, votes by the 538 Electoral College members. Now, in order to be elected, a candidate needs to have an absolute majority, uh, which is to say at least 270. Now, it's statistically possible, by the way, for the Electoral College to be tied at uh, 269 to 269. That happened, in effect, once before in the past in 1800 and it caused uh, the need or created a need for changing the electoral college system. Uh, but uh, Jefferson and Burr both received the same number of electoral votes, so there was no majority in 1800. It took more than 30 ballots in the House of Representatives uh, to resolve that election. So if the coin lands on edge, and it can now with Maine and Nebraska uh, splitting their electoral votes, uh, it could take a long while before the election is finally resolved. Uh, let's see, states have three to 55 electoral votes. Washington, D.C. has three. And uh, one more popular vote in California, which uses a uh, winner-take-all system like most states, uh, do, could allocate uh, 55 electoral votes to one candidate. Now, this, after all, is Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, uh, Bryan Hospital, et cetera, makes uh, William Jennings Bryan uh, relevant, and I just happened to be looking at the uh, uh, U.S. Library of Congress website and ran across this uh, cartoon of William Jennings Bryan and Uncle Sam on the Electoral College campus. And you can see, if you look at that pennant there, it says Electoral College campus. Now, unfortunately, I think it's fair to say that Bryan actually uh, flunked out three times. He tried three times for the presidency, uh, so he has the uh, uh, he's tried more times, success well, unsuccessful than anybody else. Uh, if you look at this map, uh, this shows the result of the 1896 election when he came closer than he did later on. Uh, but red Republicans and blue Democrats, um, basically he carried the South and West. Uh, but the catch at the time was that the Northeast had more population and hence a more electoral vote. But, but take a look at this, and we're going to cycle back to uh, this later on. And it may be that um, failing the Electoral College um, uh, test might be something that's coming along. Now, a presidential election involves several stages. And obviously it involves the nomination stage. I'm not going to be talking about that uh, particularly, but November 8th is election day. Uh, that's when voters assemble and cast ballots for electors. Uh, arguments over uh, whether electors have been successfully selected or not have to be settled by December 19th. And then certificates of ascertainment are sent to uh, uh, the National Archives and various other places. Uh, December 19th, the electors meet to vote for president and vice president. They each get one vote, one for president, one for vice president. And then send certificates of the vote to the president of the Senate and the National Archives. Uh, then on January 6th, uh, Congress meets in joint south session uh, with the House and Senate both meeting simultaneously in order to uh, hear the re results of the Electoral College vote. Now, if nobody has a majority for uh, president, uh, then the House gets to select the president, and the vote in the House is by state. So all 55 representatives in California uh, have to come to some agreement as to how California's electoral vote would be cast, and so on. In the Senate, on the other hand, each senator has one vote. Um, 
It, uh, that's one of the reasons, by the way, it took so many electoral or so many votes in, in the House in, 18, in 1800. Then January 20th, Inauguration Day, if the House can't come to an agreement, by the way, the Vice President will be inaugurated and serve as acting President until and unless uh, the President. Now, when you and I vote, it turns out that the electors that we vote for in Nebraska are pledged to vote for uh, the candidate that's shown on the ballot. It used to be in some states, by the way, that people voted individually for uh, different electors, and they were, electors were on the ballot. Uh, but this is from the uh, National Archives, and the states that I have shaded uh, sort of purple there are states where there are statutes or other requirements that electors vote for who uh, they were pledged to vote for. But on the other hand, the uh, light tan or cream, uh, the electors, there are no penalty for electors voting for whomever they, they choose. Now, uh, they have to select somebody who is eligible to be president in terms of age and various other requirements. Now, this is a cartogram, and the, the states are uh, shown in proportion to their electoral votes. Now, the last eight elections, um, and I picked the last eight elections because four were won by Republican candidates and four were won by Democratic candidates, so it's a, an even four. Uh, but this shows uh, the states that are shaded uh, bright red uh, were are cast, uh, or excuse me, Republican electoral votes at least seven out of the eight times. Uh, the dark blue, uh, Democratic electoral votes at least seven out of the eight times. It turns out that these are pretty well evenly matched over those eight elections. So uh, Republican candidates uh, got about 260 electoral votes in each of, in at least five of those elections from uh, the states that are blue or, or dark blue or light blue, and they are, it's the other way around, but anyway, so uh, basically sort of 260 electoral votes are in an in ordinary election, you'd expect it, and then, then the question is, what about some uh, states being pushed over the edge, or, and you can see the ones that were split 4-4 are only Ohio and, and uh, Nevada. Now, elections tend to run in groups, and these are correlation coefficients, and basically the higher the correlation coefficient, uh, the more similar this election is to uh, the one previously. And you'll notice correlation coefficients range from minus one to plus one. You'll notice that many of those, these are for states, by the way, most of these correlation coefficients are in the high 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and so on. So there's a strong tendency for the last election, like the weather. Today's weather is often uh, follows yesterday's weather, et cetera. Elections are very similar, too. The current election is likely to be very much like the last one. But it turns out that there can be uh, patterns that are rather more complicated than that. And if you want a discussion about the, some of the technology, uh, there's an article in the July issue of, of the 1988 Scientific American uh, excuse me, that details uh, some of the pr patterns that I'm going to be talking about. So that's a source that you can look at. It's in man many public libraries, et cetera. Now, I'm going to draw from the atlas of the 2012 election that I had a number of collaborators on from uh, various universities around the United States. And one of the things we did was to apply the factor analysis method uh, that I'd applied earlier in that 1988 Scientific American article and some other articles. In a sense, what we're trying to do is we, we, we have all, a map of every election from 1872 to the present, and it's a detailed county-level map, and we sort of scatter them around the room, and we're trying to figure out a way to effectively and efficiently collect those into piles that are similar kinds of elections. And so those, show, those are not proportions of votes, but rather degrees of correlation with specific kinds of party systems they're sometimes referred to. Well, looking at uh, elections from each of these uh, patterns, uh, this is the 1876 election. That was a highly contested election. It was during the Reconstruction period. And it turns out that there were some areas in the South, you'll notice, where uh, Republican votes were cast in that election. For the most part, those were areas where black, uh, blacks were en enfranchised to vote. Uh, but so north to south, you'll notice the uh, uh, red Republican north and a blue Democratic south. Then this was 1896. And 1896, of course, is when William Jennings Bryan uh, contested for the election against McKinley. Uh, previous to that, by the way, there had been fusion of populist Republican candidates for governor and state senator or state senate, and even, I think, for the national uh, 
uh, Congress from various areas in the South. So when Bryan was nominated as a Democratic populist in 1896, it caused various uh, internal divisions within uh, actually both parties. But you'll notice once again a Republican North and a Democratic South. And again, the greater population is in the North area. Now this is 1912, and this is another uh, interesting election. This, of course, is when Wilson was elected, uh, but that was because the Republican Party had effectively split up into uh, the Progressive Party that uh, was led by Roosevelt, and the Republican Party led by Taft. Roosevelt got more popular electoral votes than uh, uh, Taft did, but Wilson ended up winning the election. Um, and notice the kind of pattern there, blue south. Now this is 1940. And this is, again, I remember that uh, Roosevelt, Theod or uh, Franklin Roosevelt now, was nominated from New York. But if you look at that map, you'll notice that uh, Roosevelt didn't, didn't uh, again, read uh, Republicans and Blue Democrats. A lot, of New a lot of New England, and for that matter, New York, particularly the, the areas outside New York City, were Republican. So, Red North, Republican North, after all, the... Uh, uh, party of Emancipation, etc. So this is right on through this period. Uh, blacks are now sort of shifting allegiance from the Republicans to the Democrats in various areas. Uh, so that's, that's a pattern that stayed right up until the 1940s and early 1950s. Now we see 1960, and this of course is the Nixon-Kennedy election, and you'll notice that there were some folks in the South that did not uh, vote for Kennedy. I think Kennedy wasn't even on the ballot in Alabama. Um, so you look at that, but still red Republicans and blue Democrats, uh, no to blue Democrats in the South and red Republicans in the North. Even though Kennedy was from Massachusetts, you'll notice a fair amount of Massachusetts is still Republican. Uh, 1964, uh, there was the election that uh, uh, Johnson won, Goldwater versus Goldwater. Goldwater was the first Republican to score strongly in the South since whatever, okay. Uh, and you'll notice that this is for the first time then that there's a red, a number of red states in the South. Uh, this was a landslide for Johnson. 61% uh, of the vote for Johnson, less than 40% of the vote for Goldwater in the popular vote. Uh, this is 1972, and this is an election that basically was a sweep for Nixon. Uh, my recollection is that uh, uh, McGovern got uh, Massachusetts and Minnesota, I think, or maybe it was Wisconsin, but he only had electoral votes from two states. So the red all over everywhere. Then 1992, and this is uh, an election. You'll notice a lot of these interior areas uh, don't show up in the high uh, categories of, of one or the other. Uh, independent, Ross Perot had a big impact on this, about a fifth of the uh, popular ballot, although zero electoral votes. Uh, third parties don't do well in the Electoral College, usually. They did very well in the Electoral College in 1860. Uh, so uh, uh, Lincoln was the last third party candidate to win the Electoral College. But you can see that pattern. And then if we move forward to a state level uh, pattern, uh, this, these are from that atlas of the uh, uh, 2012 election. Uh, these are percentages by state, and you'll notice that the uh, northeastern seaboard and the, uh, the left coast or west coast show up very strongly in this. Uh, one of the reasons, even though California has 55 electoral votes, it's not been attracting very many uh, campaign uh, visits recently, basically because the Republicans don't feel that they have much chance at all in California. Uh, New York, even though Trump is from New York, uh, sort of category. But notice a uh, number of red states in the Mountain West and the South, and then third party votes. Now, if we look at these patterns at a county scale, uh, this is the Democratic popular vote in 2012, and the light areas are less than 30% of the, of the popular vote, and there are quite a few of them across the uh, Great Plains and the Mountain West, et cetera. Uh, the blue areas are 70% or more uh, popular vote in the counties for uh, the uh, Democratic candidate in 2012. Now, the Republican candidate in 2012, uh, Romney, did pretty well. You'll notice all sorts of areas through there. But one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is sort of hold that map in your mind, and then let's jump back to 1896, OK? Now, the 2012 map and the 1896 map, in a lot of ways, were almost mirror images of one another. So it looks like, geographically, uh, that, whoops, 
In a sense, it may well be that geographically the parties have basically switched sides. And there are interesting ramifications in terms of, uh, certainly in terms of where supporters are located. So there is a Republican popular vote. Uh, this is the Libertarian vote. And notice the Libertarian vote in, uh, in 2012, uh, particularly in uh, some areas of the central Midwest and then the uh, uh, Great Plains and Mountain West areas. So those are areas where both neither party can claim an absolute uh, command over the electorate. And the same thing, by the way, this is the Green Party, and you'll notice places like Maine, et cetera, and uh, the, the Washington, Oregon, not surprisingly. Uh, so there are green, can green candidate support. Now, how much third party effects are going to influence the 2016 election? Uh, that's an interesting issue. Uh, I understand libertarian voter registration has been going up. Uh, so there's some really interesting potential consequences here. Uh, this is an overall map of, of third party, uh, not only libertarian, uh, Green Party, but also other third party candidates. Apparently there's a third party candidate in Utah who's doing pretty well. Uh, so it's conceivable that Utah might end up uh, going either Democratic or maybe for a third party candidate this time. I'm not all positive. In terms of voter participation, uh, notice that there is overall generally a south to north gradient. Uh, so that voters in the South are less likely to cast or uh, exercise their franchise and vote for a candidate than voters in the North, except you'll notice in the Mississippi Delta region and in Virginia and Carolina, et cetera. Uh, so those are areas where uh, voter registration and voter participation have been going up. These are very contested areas, Virginia, uh, North Carolina. Uh, well, I suspect some of those other areas may well have uh, higher turnouts. So the overall map looks like that. But of course, that implies that uh, if you look at that, you wonder what, how it was that a Democrat won the 2012 election. Well, it turns out that there are also other things. Remember I mentioned those uh, various frontiers, an urban or a rural frontier, an urban frontier, and a metropolitan frontier. And that's essentially, I think, what's represented by these maps here. And these come from that, uh, that historical atlas of US presidential election. Uh, the are proportional to the number of votes cast in a county. Now, if you look at 1848, uh, the uh, United States was still predominantly rural. Uh, 18, uh, 1900, the United States did not become more than half urban until 1920. Uh, but you'll notice that there tends to be a concentration, particularly in the north, northeastern manufacturing belt. Uh, then 1948, you'll notice that uh, some of the urban counties are beginning to get uh, cast more ballot in rural counties, so rural to urban migration uh, by this point is beginning to have an impact on uh, popular voting patterns. And then you'll notice that by 2000 uh, that um, basically we're looking at a metropolitan electorate. Now if we connect that with 2012, uh, this map tells the sort of sub-story behind uh, how it was that uh, uh, Barack Obama was elected president. Uh, these circles, by the way, at the bottom are proportional to the number of votes cast in all counties in the United States uh, that were, uh, had no uh, uh, micropolitan or metropolitan settlement within them. So these are essentially rural counties. These are ur uh, counties with less than 10,000 uh, urban residents. Now, altogether, they cast about 8.5 million votes. And you'll notice that Romney carried the rural counties across the United States. Um, Micropolitan counties are those with uh, metropolitan or urban populations of 10,000 to 50,000, and they cast a total of about 12 and a half million votes together in uh, uh, 2012. And once again, Romney carried that about, uh, what, 7.3 to, uh, to 5 million. So he carried micropolitan areas by two and a half a million votes or so. Then metropolitan areas are 50,000 to 1 million. And once again, you'll notice that that was a pretty, or there it's a pretty close contest. Uh, Romney received 19 million votes and, and Obama about 18 million votes. But take a look at the, that last circle. That last circle identifies all the counties in the United States within metropolitan areas having populations of more than 1 million. I've got four minutes. Of more than 1 million. And you will notice that such counties cast close to 70 million votes. 
So the metropolitan counties collectively cast more votes, or people living in those counties cast more votes than those living in rural areas, in small town areas, and even in small metropolitan areas. Uh, so the difference in the election then was Obama got 39 million votes from big metropolitan areas, uh, Romney got about 29 million votes in big metropolitan areas. So Obama led in big metropolitan areas by 10 million votes. And that obviously overshadowed the, the uh, smaller margins for Romney or margin for Romney in other areas. So that's essentially why in this atlas and for the current election, it's a good idea to look not only at a, a map that shows the states in, in their aerial proportions based on uh, land area, and also a map showing the states based upon their population and the number of electoral votes. Uh, and you get rather different views. So if this were a normal election, and I'm not sure that it is, but if this were a normal election, at this point it would be probably pretty close to a toss-up. Remember that we look over the last eight elections or so uh, that Republicans can be fairly well assured of about 250, 260 electoral votes. Democrats can be fairly well assured of 250 to 260 electoral votes. And then there's that contest in the middle. Uh, but this is probably not uh, going to be such an election. Uh, how it will end up, I'm not sure. Uh, National Public Radio uh, about a week ago um, did a forecast of, of votes uh, by state, and that's what their forecast uh, shows on the, uh, are using states represented by area. And if you total those up, um, about 270 electoral votes. I think this morning I was watching TV and they're talking about forecasting 300 electoral votes or more uh, for the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate. But notice then that if we go back to 1896, Basically, we'd have to change the shading, most likely, okay? And blue would be red, and red would be blue. So there are interesting sorts of patterns when we look across a, a long series of elections. Thank you, Clark. We'll give John Hibbing his explanation, though, it's time to talk about um, voting behaviors. John Hibbing is the Foundation Regents University Professor of Political Science at the University of Nebraska, where he has taught for 35 years. His current research focuses on the biological and psychological basis of political ideology. John has been a NATO Fellow in Science, a Senior Fulbright Fellow, a Guggenheim Fellow, and is an elected Fellow in the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His research has been featured in numerous popular venues, including Time, Fox News, NPR, CBS, The New York Times, Der Spiegel, The Los Angeles Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The Daily Show. John is a co-author of Predisposed, Liberals, Conservatives, and the Biology of Political Differences. I bet you can find that book on Amazon. Please join me in welcoming John Hibbing. Thank you, John, and uh, thanks for having me. It's a delight to be a part of this program and to share the stage with Clark, whose work I have long admired. The only downside of this arrangement, I think, is that uh, both Clark and I kind of specialize in more uh, national things than specifically Nebraska. Uh, elections in the history of Nebraska elections. He does it from a, a geographical point of view and I do it from more of a biological and psychological point of view. I might try to work that into the tail end of my remarks, but we were encouraged to spend some time on uh, Nebraska politics. This is the Nebraska State Historical Society. We are in the Nebraska uh, Museum. So um, I was kind of handed the short straw on this and even though um, I'm sure that many people in this room know a lot more about Nebraska uh, politics and the history of Nebraska elections than I do. I'm going to uh, focus my remarks on that to kind of counterbalance Clark's uh, great presentation um, on the national scene. I just don't have, you know, Clark's pretty maps or his insights, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm in charge of this. In any event, uh, I imagine since uh, you all know so much about Nebraska uh, politics and Nebraska history, you all know who James Pittenger is, right? James S. Pittenger. Well, I'm playing with you, you really shouldn't know. 
Uh, although uh, James S. Pittenger was once the Secretary of State of Nebraska. Now, no offense to John Gale, but you know that in itself might not deserve mention in a talk like this, uh, just being Secretary of State. But, so there's something special about James S. Pittenger. It turns out he was the last Democrat to be the Nebraska Secretary of State. When do you suppose that was? Well, you have to go all the way back to the election of 1950. 1950 was the last time Nebraska elected a Secretary of State. What about Attorney General? Nebraska State Attorney General. Story's a little bit better for Democrats here. You only have to go back to 1960. So instead of uh, 64 years, we're over half a century since we've had a Nebraska Attorney General who was a Democrat. State Auditor. Um, well, again, maybe a little bit better here. Uh, no Democrat has been elected State Auditor since the New Deal, except for one. So you have to go all the way back to the 1930s. Uh, except for John Breslow, some of you may be familiar with that, who was elected uh, in the 1990s. Although, well, once he was elected Nebraska State Auditor, he promptly switched his party affiliation from uh, Democrat to Republican. And finally, what about State tre Treasurer? Well, here also Democrats have one success story in recent history. My friend Don Rocky was elected Nebraska State Treasurer in 1990. Although I don't think Dawn would mind me mentioning that she probably was elected state treasurer because a Republican incumbent, a guy named Frank Marsh, uh, was caught in a scandal. He was caught using his personal credit card uh, to make, um, no, sorry, his state, uh, state credit card for using personal phone calls. Um, seems reasonably tame today because in this day and age, some elected officials are using uh, state equipment to do more salacious kinds of things, but we won't talk about that. Uh, in any event, uh, you know, I, I think Dawn would be with me in pointing out that it probably is the case that she would not have won that race uh, in 1990 if Frank Marsh had not been involved in, in that scandal. Uh, before that, you'd have to go back to the LBJ landslide. So anyway, what it amounts to is over the course of the last 50 plus years of all the electoral contests for the so-called statewide constitutional offices, two Democrats have won. And one probably won because the Republican incumbent was in a scandal and the other changed party ID as soon as it became uh, became an office holder. Well, why this focus on lower level constitutional offices? Well, I think it's a, one of the best ways to really size up a state uh, because these are elections that are uh, pretty low salience elections. There isn't a lot of information on these individuals. Some people know and certainly there can be an event like uh, the Marsh scandal which could you know, vault it into the public eyes. But for the most part, people are not aware of a lot of the details and personal facts about the individuals running for the statewide constitutional offices. So I think people frequently fall back on party identification and this isn't a bad place to look if you want to really kind of get a feel for what, what the parties uh, are like in the state and, and where the strength is. So maybe this is a long-winded way of saying that Nebraska is a pretty darn Republican state um, and I, I think that's a good way, to, uh, good way to size that up. Don't, Nebraskans, uh, don't Nebraska Democrats do a little bit better in more salient statewide contests? Um, a little, um, but you know, if you tallied up, only four Democrats have served as U.S. Senators since the, the New Deal. J.J. Uh, Exxon, Ed Zerinsky, Bob Kerry, and Ben Nelson. And none of them really is likely to show up on a list of, of liberal uh, Senators. In fact, uh, uh, Zerinsky, Exxon, and Nelson pretty consistently were uh, charted as among the most conservative Senators during the time they served. Bob Kerry is probably the one who pushed uh, the envelope a little bit more than anybody else in terms of, of casting some liberal votes. Um, and that was not without repercussions. You know, Kerry ran for re-election in 1994, and you may or may not remember this, but he ran against a person named Jan Stoney. And Stoney ran what I think could charitably be described as an uninspired campaign, and she still came pretty close. It was 54 or 46, somewhere, somewhere around there. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Bob Kerry would have lost if he had decided to run for re-election again in 2000. Uh, which of course he didn't. So, um, you know, it is true that Nebraska Democrats are able to win a Senate seat, a U.S. Senate seat, on occasion, but um, they need to be pretty conservative and it doesn't happen very often. What about governor? Um, here I think the story is a little bit better than it is for senator. Senator, um, Although, if you think about it, it's, it's uh, been 18 years, it hasn't happened in this century, uh, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon, that is, uh, the Democrat uh, gaining control of the governor's mansion. Uh, if you need further evidence, I thought 20, 2014 kind of provided it. I mean, Chuck Hasselbrook was pretty well positioned for a Democrat um, with all his years uh, and rural connections from time at the, the, the Center for Rural Affairs. Um, he knew a lot of people. He ran a smart, uh, capable campaign, I thought. It was an open seat. 
uh, yet he didn't come close. You know, that was not, uh, not a close contest in 2014. Uh, Ricketts won fairly handily in the, in the general election. Um, so, you know, again, long-winded way of saying that uh, Nebraska is an awfully uh, Republican state. Moreover, as Clark uh, indicated to some extent, Nebraska is a Republican state in a Republican region. You can see that from a lot of his maps. If you define the Great Plains as kind of the six states running up the rib of the country, and I know we shouldn't, people have very, very clear definitions of what the Great Plains are, but if we're just kind of using, uh, if we fall back on state boundaries, certainly um, those six states running up from Texas through Oklahoma and Kansas, uh, Nebraska and the Dakotas uh, are an important part of the Great Plains. If you look at those six states, um, the region really, even though it has not historically always been Republican, it has been lately. Texas went for Jimmy Carter in 1976. Uh, and other than that, um, those six states have, um, uh, have, have not gone Democratic at the presidential level, except, of course, for, uh, for one district in Nebraska in 2008, uh, when the Omaha district, the second district, did go for, uh, for Barack Obama. So, um, you know, I think part of the reason, of course, is that Democrats tend to do well in cities, and Republicans do well in, in rural areas, another thing that came through in, in Clark's maps. Uh, in fact, in 2012, um, Republicans won only four of the major metropolitan areas, and you probably want to know what they are. So um, that would be Salt Lake City, which wouldn't be surprising since uh, Mitt Romney uh, was running in 2012, uh, Dallas and Oklahoma City, and Phoenix were the four. Other than that, the Democrats won every major metropolitan area, uh, even though many of them are in quite conservative states. So uh, perhaps it's not surprising that the one place in Nebraska where the Democrats could chip away would be the, the area, that, the district that's dominated by, uh, by Omaha. It's certainly not a, not a coincidence. It may happen again in 2016. It's been an interesting, interesting situation with that district. Um, let me make a few comments about party registration. Uh, in 2000, here are the numbers. Nebraska uh, broke down this way. 50% registered as Republican, 36% as Democrat, and 14% is independent. We call them nonpartisans in, uh, in Nebraska. How has that changed in the last 16 years? So earlier in 2016, the most recent data I could get, um, the Republicans had dropped from 50% to 48.6, so down about a point. Uh, that might surprise some people, but uh, let's put it in larger context here. Uh, Democrats were at 30.9, and that was down from 16 years earlier when they had 36, so down a little bit over, over five points. And nonpartisans were up from 14% in 2000 to 20.5% in, uh, in 2016. So there's been a big growth in independence, as, as a lot of you uh, are probably aware. Um, and, a, and Democrats are having trouble. Only three in 10 Nebraskans register as, as uh, Democrats right now. So that means that 61.1% of all people who register for one of the two major parties in Nebraska register as Republicans. So remember that number, 61.1%, because I want to focus a little bit on the nonpartisans to kind of think about how they're, um, how they're breaking out, what kind of behavior they're engaging in, and that's a difficult thing to trace. So here's what I thought we could do. Uh, you know, sometimes it's argued that a large slice of this nonpartisan population in Nebraska means that Nebraska is not really such a conservative state, but it's an indep independent state. I've never really believed this. You know, I know people, uh, people make that claim. And we certainly do have an independent streak once in a while. But for the most part, if it's independent, it's conservatively independent. And I think most of those, most of those people registering as nonpartisans actually break for Republicans, as I'll try to show now. Um, so uh, let's compare it with election results. And then we can kind of figure out and in, infer what the, uh, what the nonpartisans are probably doing. In 2014, if we focus only on votes for the two major parties, which is almost all of them, and we add up what happened in the House seats, the three House districts, uh, it turns out that 67% uh, of the vote went for the Republicans. And that would be Jeff Fortenberry, Lee Terry, and Adrian Smith. So about two to one Republican across those three uh, congressional seats, uh, even though, remember, uh, Ashcroft won, a Democrat won that race in 2014 in the, uh, in the second district, so that was kind of surprising. The Senate race in 2014, Ben Sass against Dave Domina went uh, two to one uh, for Sass. That was not even close, well over 60% there. The governor's race uh, was more competitive, uh, but even there, Ricketts won uh, 57 to 39, or if you look at just a two-party vote, uh, that's uh, almost 60% of, of the two-party vote that, uh, that Ricketts received. As far as the presidential level, Romney won 60% of the vote in Nebraska in 2012, if you average across the three, three districts. districts. So um, the reason I'm bringing all this up is that it seems to me that if you look at uh, 
uh, what's, how the partisans are breaking in Nebraska, it's pretty much about the same way that the nonpartisans are breaking in Nebraska. Um, it's not the case that Democrats are attracting a lot of these independent nonpartisan voters. It's not even the case that they're breaking 50-50 for Democrats and Republicans. They're breaking about 60-40 the same way that the party registrants are. So, you know, it, it may be the case that those nonpartisans are somewhat available to the Democratic Party for the picking, but generally these are fairly conservative individuals who are going to, uh, going to end up voting Republican uh, more likely than not. So let's face it, you know, it seems to me J.J. Exxon built the Nebraska Democratic Party in the 1970s, uh, and ever since it's really struggled to maintain itself as a viable statewide entity. Um, I know some people think, well, if they just uh, do a better job organizing, that you know, it's just a, a question of, of uh, applying themselves and working hard. I don't believe that. You know, I think there's, the Democrats in Nebraska are swimming against a very important ideological current. Uh, it's not the case of inept uh, organization. Uh, it's just a kind of, uh, kind of political philosophy that tends to dominate in Nebraska. So uh, let's bring it up to the present time. What does all this mean then, this background mean for what's happening in 2016? Well, what's going to happen? We're, we're always encouraged to make predictions, and then when we make predictions, people will get mad at me. That's usually the way, the way things happen. Um, uh, but we do need to think about 2016, and, and that was part of the, the whole motivation for this event. Well, there's not much to say in Nebraska in a way. I can, don't get angry with me yet. Let me, let me finish. Um, <laughs> You know, there, there's not a lot going on uh, in some respects as far as the constitutional offices that I made such a big deal of earlier in my remarks. Uh, we don't have them. Uh, you know, we structure that so that uh, those four constitutional offices, they serve four-year terms now. They haven't always, and they're elected in midterms, so we don't have any of those races to talk about. Uh, moreover, we don't have a Senate seat this cycle, and we don't have a governor's race this cycle. So if you think about it, given the fact that we do divide our electoral college uh, on the basis of a district-by-district district, uh, arrangement, we really don't have a statewide race uh, in Nebraska, uh, since even the presidency isn't. Um, nonetheless, uh, that does leave us with, with something. We have uh, several interesting unicameral races. Uh, we have a competitive House race in, in the Omaha district. Um, uh, Don Bacon against Doug Ash Ashford. I said Ashcroft before, didn't I? Sorry. Uh, Doug Ashford. Um, a very important ballot measure, the uh, death penalty. Uh, in fact, as I was walking over to give this talk today, somebody handled me, handed me a flyer. Uh, saying I should do a, cast a vote a certain way on the death penalty, so that's certainly on, on people's minds. Uh, and then, of course, the presidential race, even though it's not, uh, uh, in some respects, a, a statewide race here. Uh, in other respects, it is, and we, we do allocate certain uh, elements of our electoral college votes on the basis of the outcome for the statewide race. So what's going to happen? Well, of course, it's pretty easy. Um, I've always joked with uh, radio and TV people who come to interview me that it's pretty easy to look smart in Nebraska because you just say the Republicans are going to win. Um, and so I've been doing that for 30 years, and usually it turns out okay uh, for my prognostications. But uh, here we go again. Donald Trump will carry Nebraska in 2016. A bold pr uh, prediction. Um, of course, the really interesting thing is whether the Democrats will be able to hold on and, and grab the, uh, the second district uh, race as they did in 2008, but not 2012. Um, if, uh, and maybe I'm like some of you that I look at Nate Silver and some of those guys a lot, and they really had the seat going back and forth. It's pretty difficult to know. You know, we don't do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, polling in Nebraska generally statewide, and it becomes even more difficult if you're going to poll in a in a sub uh, section of the state like like one district. So I don't think we have a real good feel for that. Certainly, you know, given recent events and given the challenges that the Trump campaign is facing, it's not unrealistic to think that the second district could go for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Um, and I suppose some people think maybe even the first district has a chance of going that way. I think that's probably unlikely. Um, it does raise a question, wh why is this? What's, um, you know, why might it be the case? I mean, if Trump's going to win statewide, he could easily win by nearly 60 percent, which is kind of our default, it seems like, in Nebraska. Republicans winning 60 percent. How could that be? Why, uh, why, with Trump having all these difficulties uh, with his campaign and in other parts of the country, why don't we hold in there and, and uh, still give nearly 60 percent uh, to him? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I think back to Dave Heineman's victory over Tom Osborne in the Republican primary of 2006. Uh, it was a very interesting situation. Uh, and most people believe that, that Osborne's defeat in the primary came because uh, he was viewed as too lenient on uh, immigration matters. And Dave Heineman came out and was very forceful and firm uh, on some things about how to treat uh, illegal immigrants. Um, and so I, and I think there's some truth to that, and I think if that was an eye-opener for me, and it, and it makes me a little bit less surprised that a candidate like Donald Trump, who is pushing things like building a wall in Mexico, uh, banning Muslims from entering the country, 
and generally getting tough on immigrants. Uh, you know, I think that's not at all something that would be unpalatable to uh, the views of many Nebraskans. So I, I can see that fitting in with, uh, with the way Nebraska has gone uh, historically on those kinds of issues. This is where you know, I think the recent events fit in a little bit with my research, uh, which, as, uh, as John mentioned, has to do with, with biological and psychological kinds of things. What we like to do uh, very briefly in our research is to show people pictures of, of maybe upsetting or negative or disgusting things, like a guy eating worms or uh, hurricane damage. And then we measure with physiological equipment how people respond to that. Some people have a very noticeable physiological response, and others are, are pretty much nonplus. They don't, nothing happens uh, physiologically. Uh, well, the interesting thing is we found that people who do respond noticeably to negative things, um, especially threatening things, tend to vote uh, in a conservative fashion, especially on issues like uh, minimizing immigration, promoting law and order, uh, punishing criminals, such as the death penalty, uh, discouraging in-group norm violators. I think the Colin Kaepernick uh, event with uh, you know, standing for the national anthem, which has uh, implications here in Nebraska too with some of the athletes, uh, is a very fascinating one. Enhancing security, spending on defense, Defeating other countries, you know, Donald Trump, that's uh, his stance on, on trade policy, I think is driven less by economic uh, wisdom than a competition with other groups. We're going to kill uh, Mexico and China because they're killing us right now. So I think it's a very group-based kind of thing. Expanding gun rights, you get the idea. So I think there's a, uh, a definite uh, threat sensitivity component to this. That's not to say one way is bad and one way is good, you know, being threat sensitive. I always put it this way, biologists have a word for organisms that are not sensitive to threats in their environment, and that word is dead. So, you know, you do need to do that. On the other hand, you can obviously overdo it, and you become so sensitive to threats that you're not open to uh, trade and new ideas that might, might benefit you. So, I guess I'll just conclude with, um, with the point that I think whenever elections are fought over these kinds of group-based issues, in-group, out-group, um, security kinds of things, um, whether it be the Civil War or what we're seeing right now. I, I think you're going to have a greater intensity. There'll be a rawness and an emotionality to the race that you don't oftentimes have. And I think that's part of what's going on right now. It's not to say that issues like tax policy, um, the size of government aren't important, but I think from an evolutionary point of view, they're a little bit secondary. Uh, they're not part of the, this kind of primal division, which I see uh, as being a very group-based and security kind of thing. And I think whenever that becomes the focal point of an election, then you're going to have the, these uh, really, unfortunately, intense kinds of exchanges. And to me, that's what's happened in 2016. That concludes my remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I am going to invite Clark to join me up here. And you are free to pepper us with questions. And he will answer. I'll give one, and maybe you, John. Uh, do you feel like the, the whole movement here, rise of identity group politics, is really fits right into your biological, psychological, uh, behavioral kind of view, and which, of course, is reflected, I think, as it has been in Clark's data and charts and so forth? So the question is whether the kind of uh, orientation toward identity group politics uh, fits in with some of my remarks and uh, also to Clark's uh, uh, presentation of the patterns of election results. And yes, I certainly do. You know, it's, it's something we don't like to talk about a lot. Um, you know, we'd like to think that people are above this uh, and we're not so aware of, of these identities. Um, and I think one of the things that the Trump campaign uh, has, uh, has pointed out, uh, intentionally or not, is that we're, we're not really beyond that. And um, there are certain people who I think have been really deeply frustrated by the fact that they haven't felt comfortable talking about, uh, about some of their attitudes. It's not, not correct. So I think it's, it's been almost a liberating thing. And it, it, maybe uh, the, the emotions have spilled over in a way that, uh, that has not always been, uh, been beneficial to the system. But I, I certainly agree with your comment. I think the identity group politics is a great illustration yeah. of what I was saying. Yeah, I guess one of the things I would comment on that is that in some ways, the U.S. Constitution was written in order to try to prevent that kind of group politics. Uh, so the formation of political parties with group connections, uh, which occurred very early on, was something that the, the framers of the Constitution either A, tried to prevent, or B, uh, wrote a framework that it turns out in retrospect uh, was very effective at handling some of those patterns, but breaking down in the 1860s, for example. Uh, so, so, so group patterns and those group patterns 
show up strongly on maps at a whole host of different geographical scales, all the way up from uh, city blocks and, and frontal tracks all the way up to state and, and regional scales. So yeah, groups and, and, and patterns, there's a lot, but there's a lot to that. Thanks. John. Do vice presidential candidates matter in the outcome of presidential elections? You start with that one. Do vice do vice presidential candidates matter in presidential elections? Uh, I think the answer is probably, in a way, kind of marginally. Um, so I, maybe John would like to add to that, but I don't think they have a tremendous amount of influence. No, I think they, they can do harm, as I think probably was the case with Sarah Palin in the McCain campaign. Um, they could potentially you know, pick up a key state. That's a lot of times what people are thinking when they select a nominee that maybe, uh, maybe Hillary Clinton thinks that a benefit of having Tim Kaine on the ticket is that that will solidify her stance in Virginia. Right. So I think you, know, you have those individual state kinds of things. But uh, yeah, nationwide I tend to agree with Clark. I think it's, it's pretty rare that the vice presidential uh, individual has, has actually made a, a fundamental, uh, had a fundamental effect on the outcome. Yes, ma'am. Mudslinging. That I think there's. I wonder if there's going to be people who are going to just vote the party or vote against the party. The question is, um, there's people are so disgusted and so upset with all the mudslinging that uh, you know, hypothesizing about how that might lead them to react. Will they just crawl back in their party? Uh, kind of shell and vote that way and, and uh, not pay attention to anything else? I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I have never been a big believer uh, in the tendency of people to kind of, who are disgusted to drop back onto a third party. We just haven't had uh, that much opportunity. Although Ross Perot was a good example of that. He got 20% of the vote. Um, so it can, it can happen, and that was basically a protest vote. Um, but for the most part, it seems to me that given the institutional arrangements that we have in the United States, and, you know, again, maybe back to our research a little bit, that you tend to have this spectrum of people who are really sensitive to threats and those people who just don't get it, why people are so sensitive to threats. I think there is a kind of a, a unifying dimension that does force uh, this, this dualism in, in party arrangements to a little bit, or to a certain extent. Um, so I don't know, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to break a lot of different ways. A lot of people are going to stay home. Some people will uh, go to a third party. Uh, maybe other people will stick their head in the sand and just vote for their party regardless of how upset they might be with their party member. Yeah, I think probably a, a lot of that has to do with efforts to try to control the amount of turnout and uh, different parties benefit in different ways from what groups and the, and the electorate uh, turn out to vote. Uh, one of the things I'll note though, uh, when the when election was a landslide election as let's say 1964 was or 1972 was or earlier cases, um, it generally, some of those votes are anti-votes. Uh, so, so the anti, you know, when, when the anti component is fairly large, then the, the vote for the leading candidate in the upper 50s or lower 60 percentile ranges indicates that probably there was an anti-vote contributing to the winning vote in that case. That was also true in 1932, for example, or 1936. Uh, there was a significant anti-vote that benefited Roosevelt. Uh, so I, I think that it depends from uh, a lot on the, the election setting. Yeah, if I could pop back in for just a second. I, I've always thought that we have kind of a four-party system in the United States. We have Democrats and Republicans, then we have anti-Democrats and anti-Republicans. I'm glad. And uh, I happen to live with somebody who thinks she's a Democrat, but She's really an anti-Republican. You know, she loves, she comes alive when there's a boogeyman out there, when uh, George W. Bush was president. And there are other people like that on both sides. And so I think, but then when a Democrat's in office, she's, you know, okay, she follows politics, but it's not quite the same. So I, I like the way Clark referenced antis. And so I, I mention it here because I think those people who are, you know, anti-Clinton or anti-Trump, they're probably gonna vote, right? But, but those people who tend to be the pros, they, because of the disgusting level that you mentioned, they might be a little bit less motivated. Point. We absolutely have to, but some people that will yeah. vote for the other things may not vote for the president. The point is a very good one that we should still all vote anyway because there are lots of other things on the ballot which are crucially That's important, right. even if you might be disgusted with uh, presidential candidates. And actually, if, if, if there is something that, that is, I think, 
very important in terms of the structure of politics in the United States is that uh, there we don't own, well, the, the, the elections going on at several different levels simultaneously. And so there is a reason to go to the polls to vote for a local election, even though you can't stand the person who's at the head of the national ticket, and vice versa. Uh, so that, I think, is very important. And I think it contributes a lot of support toward loyalty toward the overall US political and electoral system. Uh, the fact that there are several different levels operating simultaneously in any given election. So I think that's very important to the, the fact that we still have a, uh, I mentioned that the U.S. political parties are probably the oldest in the world. Uh, you could argue that we have the oldest constitutional system in the world. In fact, the uh, constitutions are pretty usual around the world today, but the first significant one was the United States. Uh, so the framework is a very robust framework, and it's partly because it exists at several different geographical scales simultaneously. I think that's very important. So I'm getting a high sign that we have time for maybe one, possibly two questions. Carl. I have a, I have a double barrel question. Uh, first, uh, would you gentlemen care to make predictions about the upcoming election? Uh, and then second, do you think that this elect election situation will result in the rise of a viable third party? Okay, I guess I've been thinking about that and trying to think about what some of the parallels might be with past elections. Uh, issue of a third party arising. Uh, in some ways, I think there's some parallels with the late 1900s, early 20th century, uh, with the 19, 1896 election, 1912 election. Uh, the rise of th the, the U.S. system is really loaded against third parties, um, but. The coalitions that comprise the major third parties may well be in the process of evolving. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's likely, but remember too, the party label continue being used, but the coalition of that party label uh, represents may not look very much like it was before. And, and, uh, uh, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, that I kept mentioning uh, the, road, the New Deal elections and a lot of the North was shaded red for Republicans. Um, so that's a good example, I think, of, of party labels are still being used, but the coalition they represent are, have modif or been modified a great deal. So uh, predictions, uh, Hillary Clinton will win comfortably. Uh, Republicans will continue to hold control of the House. Senate could go either way. Doesn't matter all that much because Ted Cruz will filibuster pretty much everything in sight, uh, regardless of which party <laughs> controls. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, the long term, though, I think is, is more interesting. I think both parties are in serious trouble, especially the Republican Party. I think it could easily splinter into the group. There are the nativists led by Donald Trump, the more evangelical social conservatives, which you could associate with Ted Cruz, uh, traditional economic kinds of, of conservatives, uh, such as Jeb Bush, possibly libertarians. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen down the road. Democrats are in somewhat some trouble, but not as much. Uh, clearly, the Bernie Sanders economic populist kind of group is different than the traditional uh, liberal uh, group. Um, and the parties just don't do what they have been able to do in the past, raise money. Candidates do that on their own, get out the vote, uh, social media. So I think the parties have lost uh, their mojo. It's going to be interesting to see if they survive and if these specific contours of the Democrats and Republicans survive. And with that, uh, we need to close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.